Good morning, and you're very welcome to today's Signpost webinar. We hope you're all keeping well. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be speaking about a, a slightly different uh, topic than which was advertised, um, but we are very close, closely related to the Acres uh, story. Uh, as you're probably aware, the Irish government has allocated 1.5 billion euro uh, to the new agri-environment scheme known as Acres. Uh, so far, 46,000 Irish farmers have joined the scheme and uh, a new tranche uh, is opening at the moment. Uh, today, we'll be discussing having the right action in the right place. And we'll also be hearing about one of the real success stories in birds conservation in Ireland. And I'm delighted to be joined by uh, John Lusby, Conservation Officer uh, with Bird Watch Ireland, uh, a, a name known to many across Ireland, and, and Dr. Catherine Keena, who's Countryside Management Specialist in Chagas, who's uh, well known in, uh, in, in the acres and uh, agri-environmental circles in Ireland. And uh, we have Pat Murphy uh, with Chagas as well, who's going to help us with questions uh, later on. John and Catherine, you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. How are you all today? Very well, thank you. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Mark. John, you're you're not too far from me here. Uh, you're in uh, the the lovely west of Ireland. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing uh, in in Birdwatch Watch Ireland? Right, yeah. So, um, so I suppose a lot of my work uh, is actually focused on raptors, which are birds of prey, and uh, we do a lot of work in terms of trying to understand more about our raptor populations, about what affects them, about you know the status of their populations. What I'll be talking about mostly today is specifically in relation to barn owls, and as you, as you described, you know, there's a lot of positives there. Recently, we've seen uh, recently barn owl populations doing quite well recently, which is you know a fantastic conservation success story, and we help to, to design a specific measure in acres which is the barn owl action and that's tried to to further help barn owl populations and um and, and i'm happy to to discuss some of the the positives and some of the learnings from the, the implementation of that measure so far and and how we can continue can continue to improve it and hopefully with with you know some seeing some real benefits on the ground for um for for barn owls and other biodiversity thanks john and uh, catherine we're coming into a very busy part of the season now when it comes to acres actions and uh, this is a really timely presentation uh could you tell us about the the type of uh work that farmers are, are doing at the moment or coming up over the next uh, few weeks and months yeah well the work that farmers and advisors in particular are are, are plant doing the plans at the moment so we really need to get these plans right so there's two two angles at the moment uh, acres too is just opening up um for for new applicants and then we also have the acres one applicants who are in the cp areas are currently uh planning actions uh for the next year for the non -product productive investments so there's lots of planning going on thinking of action so that's as you said this is very timely well, I think uh, we should no, go no further without acknowledging the huge work that has been done to get us to this point, this 46,000 farmers that are in a scheme. I know that uh, from a Chagas perspective alone, there's been enormous work done by advisors uh, with scorecards uh, being being uh, completed throughout the summer. So I, I think it's uh, it's fantastic that we're in this position, that, that uh, we have this number of farmers uh, over quite relatively short period of time in, in the scheme. Absolutely. So, Catherine, you're going to start with. We're going to have two presentations. You're going to you start with the presentation on the the, the some of the practical uh, advice when it comes to uh, planning uh, the acres of actions on on your farm, and I think that's a really good title. The the right action in the right place. And just to remind everyone who's watching, uh, if you're new to the series, uh, all of our uh, webinars are recorded and are available on the Chagas YouTube channel, as well as the presentations. Um, and uh, you can also tune in uh, as a podcast on uh, all of the popular podcast uh, platforms. So, Catherine, we'll hand over to you for the presentation okay. and uh, we will uh, take questions at, at the very end after John's presentation. OK, so I'm briefly going to go through the uh, a number of different measures where I have a, a hopefully a practical comment to make, because and the most important thing is once an acres application is submitted, it can't be changed. Um, and th that is, there's two two angles then I'm watching out for. Number one is that it's in the right place that it will get through in the scheme. And number two, that it's in the right place for to deliver for for biodiversity and carbon and water quality. 
the when an advisor is looking to plan actions, there is a lot of background information. And just to remind us all what is there, there's a list of, of conservation targets for that specific farm. So we have sites in Monuments, Barn Owl, Grey Partridge, Chuff, Hen Harrier, Yellowhammer, Twite, um, Bird Maps, um, and Annex One Grassland and Lesser Horseshoe Bat Maps. So they're a background um, to help the advisor direct the farmer and the farmers. It, it's lovely to tell them that their farm is... Um, you know, is special and farmers are very interested in local, you know, as, as opposed to national are very interested in what's on their farm. And the other point there is the the PIP NNP maps, which I'll come on to here, because particularly we have a water quality issue. Agriculture has a significant role to play and acres has a significant role to play with the right measure in the right place um, for multiple benefits. So it's just sticking to the water team and thanks to my colleague, um, Ivan, who who put who gave me these slides, um, Ivan Kelly. So the impacts, the map, the, the what's available to to advisors is uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus risk areas, and they're roughly there on the screen. Uh, the blue being the the phosphorus in, and the browner one being the the nitrogen one. So that's at a at a national level. There, they've been developed by the EPA. Will focus. Um, the actions should, you know, are different for the different areas. So they help uh, help uh, identify the diffuse uh, P and N losses. Um, so on from the fact that I showed you the national map, and then this is what the advisor will see on the screen when they go into a farm. Um, the 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 areas on that farm that are at highest risk for for diffuse. Uh, P losses in this case here, and the P losses often coincide with poorly drained land, and uh, the um the the actions then they, they can be the impact. Sorry, oh, this one here. Um, sorry, it's on my screen. Um, and the impacts to water then to create barriers between the 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 land and the the water are the 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 main actions for the P. We'll come on to more of them there. Um. Um, and the N maps then, the map identifies the, the other maps, the, the colour to show up the N uh, risky areas in dark purple um, and the high risk areas for N often coincide with free draining land. So um, they have different actions associated that will help more in that in that situation. Um, sorry. OK, so the right action, then we, we have the actions and I won't go into detail there, but the P ones are the riparian strips and zones, anything that's a barrier, as I said, to stop the the uh, from the overland flow. The N is slightly different. It's uh, lighter soils. So particularly um, extensively grazed pasture, catch crops um, in the tillage areas, things that will hold, stop the the uh, the the. the N going down through the soil to the to the water. OK, so again, there's lots of suggestions there once we know to think about, to consider. Um, and it, with the grass margins there, we talked about them for the P areas in particular. And there's a whole range of them there from grass and arable and uh, and there's buffer strips and uh, ryegrass seed set, different ones paying hugely per hectare. But obviously there is the cost of fencing um, in the grass situations, not in the arable. Um, so it is, fant I'm, I'm a big fan of grass margins. Um, they just offer so much. They can be full of beautiful flora, but they can also, even if they aren't full of the beautiful flora, and we're not absolutely not talking about sowing um, flowers, which are not wild. The wild ones are the ones that are growing wild. Um, but even if they're not uh, full of those ragged robin and lovely species that you're seeing there, if you look, the the grasses are are incredibly important. A grassy margin um, is full of invertebrates and associated. Um, you know, the, uh, is the building block for other birds eating the invertebrates. Um, so it's and for the they become more diverse over time as well. But as I said, it's as much about the fauna, and I know John will touch on this afterwards, it's the fauna that live in um, rough grass margins that are incredibly important. So can't emphasise enough the, the, the importance. They're well paid, at least should be considered on every plan um, where they suit. 
So and the value of these, apart from what's in them, the linear nature of them. And we'll also talk about this with the with the hedges Um because they're they they provide corridors of movement they're networks for nature they're they're the highways through the through the landscape for the birds bats bees everything um and the the so and second point is the structure is really important so when we create grassy margins if we did nothing to them they would become scrub now scrub can be a good habitat but where we're aiming for these on the intensive farmland, um, we're missing that rough grass margin and the structure is, is, is as important as the species in it. So lumpy and bumpy is a great word to use um, seed production. So we do cut them, uh, different rules for different actions. So I won't go into them here. Uh, we do cut them to retain them as grass um, over, over time at the end of the year, once they've flowered. Um, so anyway, fantastic for overwintering beetles and all sorts of things in the grass margins. So while, you know, while they may not look stunning, they are, um, from a scientific point of view, extremely important for, mar to, to, for biodiversity. Uh, and there's just an example there of, of a of a demonstration that has been put in in Chagaskin at Rye, uh, for starting off from rye grass. So we will see over the years, you may say it doesn't look too exciting, but um, I'm sure John will have a comment on that and it, it will become even more exciting over the years. Now, continuing on the linear habitats, um, when you are talking about planting new hedges, um, the the main question to kind of, even at this point to discuss with the farmer is which type of hedge they want. Are they thinking of a top hedge or a tree line or escaped hedge? Two totally different hedges, and people get confused afterwards. Either is good. Either is allowed in acres. Both are fantastic, done the right way. Um. So uh, sorry. So, but when planting a hedge. To make that decision, we need to understand how apical dominance, how trees and shrubs grow, that the white thorn wants to grow into the bottom picture there to be in a line of white thorn trees. If we want a, a different hedge, we must manage it, but we must manage it appropriately. So if we want the top hedge, um, we want the you know we want it a good thick base and the single tree. We need to plan that from the beginning, uh, with pruning and compostable fil film. So the white thorn responds. It multiplies every time you cut it. So it's a case of where you cut it. Whereas if we want the tree line escaped hedge, um, and we want both. I stress we want both on every farm. Um, it's you you leave it grow freely. Um, so you do not prune it. And. Then moving on to the uh, <clears throat> the hedges which are not in good condition and are possibly are, are suitable in my head, very suitable for coppicing, um, are these what we call the upside down toilet brush hedges or mushroom hedges. Um, you can see there, everything looks good in the summer, in the winter now, peel your eyes over the next few months on the dark days when you are out and about um, and you can really see what's the, the structure of the hedge. And if they are, these uh, you cannot keep topping a hedge unless there's a, a good bottom on it. Um, so where we have these hedges, um, the, you know, it, these are ideal to bring back to ground level by coppicing. So they're the ones I would love to coppice the upside down toilet brush hedges. Um, I, 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 I worry about coppicing um, these beautiful old hedges, uh, relic hedges, I used to call them. There is lots of biodiversity in gappy relic hedges. It's not all about the hedge species because we're talking about the flora beneath and the, the mosses and lichens. Now, I see I know in the third picture there where there's not much between them fencing off those hedges on both sides and maybe creating a margin would be super. Um, but the, what we really don't, what we definitely don't want to do is reduce the height as in the bottom picture where it's chopped off uh, midriff and we end up with that, you know, neither a hedge nor a tree tree line. Um, but those hedges on the top, I would rather not coppice. I would rather coppice, as I said, go back to our, and we have lots of these in, in various states. A lot of our top hedges are not, don't have a good base and it is difficult to see them now, but just think, is there a good base there? If not, bring those ones back and begin again for a proper top hedge. Um, then leading into the hedge laying, um, best practice hedge laying there um, in the pictures. 
you know, fantastic, beautiful skill, really good for the hedge, done right, clean cuts, no rough, no rough cuts. Um, so super, but it really is a skill job. So be very careful it do, putting this on a plan if the farmer does not have somebody to do it or is not in a position to do the proper job themselves, either time-wise or skill-wise. And the main, main message is do not push over hedges with a digger. That is not a proper method of hedge laying. OK, so be very careful about putting in hedge laying. So there are the uh, Catherine. OK, they're the rejuvenation measures there. So then moving on to the grassland uh, and just the tree planting, just a couple of comments there to try and and uh, plant trees in, in soils that are suitable uh, for the, for those specific trees. Look around locally. The extensively the the two grassland measures, um, the extensively grazed pasture and the low input grassland, um, the the species are what we are looking for. The lovely diverse species, but um, and but they can be it, they can be a range there of of high to low of the positive speak it's a very good guide there for you know if you have a, how often in a footsteps do you meet a positive indicator that's what will be scored next year if you are putting in league this year um but it, and again but again it's not all about the species you can still get a score with with vegetation structure and field boundary um you know even as long as it's um and the league peat then is totally on hyd very much not totally but 50 percent on hydrology so if you have a uh, league on peat soils but the most the only message really today for the for the league or the intensively grazed pasture is not to put in ryegrass fields and not more than 30 percent. And that's quite a ryegrass field. I know. in yeah. Um, OK, the wild bird cover um, is a, a fantastic measure. Just be careful not to put it near houses in case there's or private houses, especially if it's not your own. Um, because of uh, there can be wildlife. There is wildlife in it. That's the purpose of it. And uh, secondly, not to put it on land that is not capable of growing a crop. The some of the I'm not going through many of the tillage measures, but just the catch crops there, a fantastic one in the nitrogen vulnerable areas we talked about. Um, and there is some changes to that. There's new species added. These, all these um documents are on the website in the department website as well as will be this presentation will be available. Um so that's the catch crops, and they've given a clear example of how to work out the seeding rate where you have um, you know, numbers of catch crops there, you do a proportion of each. Uh, and just one thing that be very aware of conditionality for catch crops that caught us out because it changed since we put in the catch crops last year. And now it's changed back to 30 percent of the land area required. But again, think of that before you put in catch crops uh, for if you're going to graze them um, and the overwinter stubble. Then there's a new option added to, to uh, the cultivation requirement. So you have two options there. Um, the rare breeds, just one word of caution when you're planning it, the screen, um, the, the make sure you hit the button for the right uh, animal. There's a button each side, let's say, of the of the uh, of the rare breed. And if you tick the one the wrong side, the wrong rare breed goes in. Um, the traditional orchards, I just throw this one up as it as it being probably not a money one, but a lovely one if the farmer is interested. And it's usually around the house and it's, uh, you know, just try to think. I know we, we're, we're thinking of the money to make it worthwhile, the farmer going in. But don't forget to go through those minor options, I could call them. But they're the ones that the farmer will remember that was that was she put she put that orchard in there 10, 20 years ago because she suggested that you know it's a lovely thing to do the dry stone walls um just a comment on those that uh the, the only ones without mortar ones that are easily maintained visible and accessible and uh, make sure there's a half rate and a full rate and the full rate is obviously where you can get at both sides and they go in as internal so just be careful of that when 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 planning just quickly on to two sides on the CP uh, areas when you're planning the farmer into acres too, and uh, just make sure be, be careful that they're in the right stream, if not queried at this point. And uh, there was a bit of confusion last year. Hopefully it'll be more straightforward. And uh, just again, going back to using the example in the right place um, from Car Caroline and Brefney, I'm using her slide here about using the right action to get the score up. It's a lovely example of, of how to improve the field score um, 
and the payment by putting in, as I said, the right action having been scored. So in this case, the payment can improve from 205 to 350 per hectare on that field by putting in a riparian buffer, a hedgerow, uh, water troughs and a gate. So that's a lovely example. And um, just in general on the, the non-productive investments that advisors are now currently discussing with farmers, they can help to improve the scores and fields. Um, you apply for these actions in the next six weeks. And look, there's a whole range of them there. I, I don't want to go into them in detail today, but they're there. Again, it's equally as important. They're the right action in the right place, but they will be screened and approved by the CP team. Um, and just another uh, comment in the CP areas from Trish in uh, Kerry West, Car uh, Car Kerry West Cork CP, um, to, to kind of be conscious of the high level objectives. And she gave me the examples there in their CP area, management of invasive species and protection of water courses are two really, really biggies that they want to address. And uh, so the invasive species, we can't actually do the NPIs for them at the moment, um, but they will be. So we need to be talking to farmers about them um, and protection of water courses, exactly as I talked about before, uh, just equally relevant, same, same relevance. Um, Thank you, Catherine. Um, huge amount of information there in a relatively short space of time. So um, definitely one for people to, to maybe look back on the presentation to get the, 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 the details. And of course, uh, do come come back to us with questions Some questions coming in already on, on your presentation, Catherine. So uh, I think we'll just move swiftly on to your presentation, John, uh, given that we have uh, limited amount of time this morning and uh, I know you have some really nice slides uh, to share with us so um, and do use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions for for Catherine or John uh, we'll have uh, plenty of time for questions at the end so John we'll hand over to you looking forward to your presentation thanks very much Mark you can see that okay can you yeah looks perfect yeah great great thanks very much and, th and thanks Catherine uh, good morning everybody so I'm going to focus um mostly on the the barn owl action in acres and um just let you know that earlier in this year earlier this year we did do a specific uh, check a signpost uh, series webinar on barn owls and and uh, on the barn owl action so that's there to refer back to if anybody wants more information we probably won't get uh, get the opportunity to cover it uh, as in depth uh, this morning well, I think the reason that we wanted to revisit it now was firstly because we've seen that uh, that, the, that this particular measure um, is is quite popular. I think it's uh, five and a half thousand uh, farmers have uh, have signed up to the Barnall action, which is great to see. But also as well, we we we've seen we we've an insight now in terms of how it's been implemented, and we've seen some you know really 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 positive um uh, you know situations where the where the measures you know is been implemented you know uh, really really well, but also some where it's maybe been. Uh, implemented less effectively so it's really good to you know to learn from that and to try and improve and particularly with the second tranche of uh, um, of acres and I think just to, uh, picking up from where Catherine um, left off it is very much you know the right action in the right place and I think this is the particular that th th this action can have huge benefits for biodiversity as well as for the farmer if it's carried out um, uh, appropriately but also the flip side of that is if it's not then you know uh, not, well, not, not only is, is it not going to be effective but it can actually Actually, have uh, have the opposite effect, have a negative effect. So, really, really important to get it right and to get it right from the start in terms of understanding, you know, which farms are suitable, which farms aren't suitable, and then you know how to uh, how to actually implement the measure. And it it is relatively straightforward. It's not it's it's not rocket science, but also appreciate that you know that that that, that there's that there's a lot there's a lot going on. There's a lot of measures to choose from, and you know, and information you know behind those as you know in terms of how to carry them out appropriately. So so hopefully this will help somewhat, um, particularly advisors and farmers considering the considering the action um um, wh whether the wh whether to uh, to implement it um, or not. So just to give a very um, brief background, firstly as to to why there is a a barn owl action and, and and why it's important. Because you know obviously there's a lot of farmland birds that are in trouble and that um, have declined. But there you know there, there's not specific actions for, for 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 all of those species. And the reason that there is for barn owls is firstly because it is a species that um, that you know is quite simple actions can have can have you know real benefits and. I'll be discussing those such as you know providing a nest box such as you know changing your approach to rodent control they can have really positive impacts and we've seen some of those impacts for barn owl populations and um, also that they're that there are species that have declined quite significantly over the last kind of uh, 50 years or so 
And just to give you a, a quick idea of this, you can see these are maps of the Barnall breeding range in Ireland from the, the, the late 60s, early 70s onwards, 20 years later, you can see quite a quite a significant um, decline in Barnall populations, a little bit um, better uh, more recently during the last um, survey, which is the, this is the Breeding Atlas survey. But um, but they, they, they remain what we call a red listed bird of conservation concern, which means um, so, so we uh, categorise all the, the, the breeding bird species and, and many of the wintering species in Ireland on a traffic light system, red, amber, or green obviously those red being those that are most threatened that we're most concerned about and barnell sits on the red list and um, being one of those species because they have declined and because they, their, their their population is threatened um more recently though it's it's been really really positive we have seen the the start of a population recovery for barnells we've seen increases in certain areas and and that is something that you know get that gives gives hope and gives and it means you know we you know we 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 can help the population and you know really puts the onus on us and and, and is really timely to implement the measures that are going to have benefits to it to ensure the population continues to to to, to continues to increase and to take advantage of the recent um of the the, the recent population recovery um, just to give a, ver a very brief example, we've been carrying out surveys on a county by county basis. This just gives a, a, an idea of the findings from a survey in County Kilkenny. And you can see the map on the left shows the Barnall breeding range 10 years ago and the change over that 10 year period on the right. So, you know, so, so there's a lot of positives there to uh, to draw on and, uh, and, 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 and and as I say, work with in terms of, you know, ensuring to improve and um, to improve things. Um, one of the the bases is then behind the uh, the the Barnall action is um uh, this this as you can see here is a typical um uh, the structure that Barnells would nest in a typical um uh, uh, Barnell nest site and uh, and an ideal Barnell nest site and there's many of these around the country and also down you know to um you know uh, uh, farmhouses like this as well as um mature trees with hollow cavities but what we're seeing is as the population is recovering there are parts of the country where that there isn't a lot there isn't a great availability of these types of nest sites and also as well if you think you know um uh, farm buildings like this you know stone sheds and the likes which would have been more commonplace in the past um obviously you know the that there's not a lot uh, not a lot of these being being built anymore it's more you know the the, the more modern farm buildings you know the the, the galvanized barns and sheds and, and and the likes and with these there's less opportunities for for wildlife for um for, for specifically for barn owl but that's something that we can um we 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 can change quite easily by providing nest boxes and that's one of the the, the cores of the the measures of the barn owl action is providing artificial nest uh, and nest boxes which are safe and secure nest sites for barn owls and we've had we've seen the benefits of these and um, they're becoming one of the most common nest sites now the barn owls use throughout the throughout, throughout the country um and it, we, we, at, at this year i think we'll have close to 200 uh, barn owl pairs nesting in nest boxes which is great and that's you know to be attributed to you know farmers putting up nest boxes you know conservation schemes um you know uh, ourselves so and, and we're seeing that you know the, the fruits of that um uh, born now which is fantastic um and also as well with the barn owl action it's not it's it's nothing new actually when you think about it you know in generations past you know farmers were trying to encourage barn owls to nest on their farms within the farmyards and the main you know reasoning for that was to you know because of the role that barn owls would play in terms of controlling rodents obviously a large part of their diet is um, rodents the likes of brown rat and house mouse which are obviously you know pest species so to have a, you know a barn owls nesting in the farmyard or close by you know kind of huge benefits in terms of rodent control so it's you know and, and you see a lot of the older um farm buildings you know uh, uh, you know were specifically designed to accommodate barn owls and and to allow access to them to come in to nest to nest in the loft space so what we're doing now with providing nest boxes essentially doing the same thing um, and and the benefits are the same in terms of um, you know encouraging barn owls to nest on your land, um, and that and that brings us to the the second you know um, element of the 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 barn owl action, which is um, trying to improve rodent control uh, measures because 
Uh, I just mentioned the benefits of having barn owls, you know, nesting on the farm, and 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 that is because they, you know, they 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 help to control uh, rodents. But there can be risk associated with that as well because barn owls feed on small mammals, on other on other species that are susceptible to being contaminated or to feeding on rodenticides or rat poisons. That that can pose a, a, a serious threat to to barn owls and to a range of other wildlife as well. So obviously we we you know we we don't want a situation whereby you're putting up a nest box, you're encouraging barn owls to nest in your land, but then you know um, uh, having a negative effect by using rodenticides, not using rodent sides appropriately so 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 we want to get get those two measures aligned and get them um and, and get them right and there can be you know really significant benefits from those and and not only for barn owls we know that um rodenticides or rat poisons can affect you know a wide range of species so by improving how we go about controlling rodents and um, how we go about use using rodenticides you know reducing their use hopefully removing their use um then that can have real benefits for for barn owls and for other for other wildlife so i'm gonna i know we're tight in time but i'm just going to go through some of the, the 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 basics of the barn owl action as i say it's it's not too complicated but it is really important to uh to to get it right and um, the, so the, the main core elements of it are firstly providing a nest box or nest boxes um, to a maximum of two nest boxes in suitable locations, um, improving rodent control and integrating what we call integrated pest management approach, which means, you know, um, it, 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 removing the requirement to use rodenticides, looking at alternative ways of making, you know, the farmyard, farm buildings less suitable for rodents, reducing the need to, to control them in the first place. But, but if there is a need to control them to looking at all alternative um, methods for um, for rodent control. And then it's not required, but um, highly recommended is linking the barn owl action to other measures which would benefit barn owls. Because if you think about it, you know, getting rodent control measures right and providing safe and suitable nest sites, getting those aligned with providing suitable habitat, that's, you know, that, that's going to have real, real benefits. And, and I'll talk, and Catherine, you know, touched on a lot of those measures already in terms of, you know, grass margins, right, right riparian grass margins hedgerow um you know he he hedgerow management and, and you know and, and they can have th those measures can have huge benefits for um for barn owls and other um biodiversity i think one of the most important things is to to um uh, be aware that there is a, a guidance document which includes all of this information. I realise that you know, you know, the uh, farmers might, might be bombarded with a lot of information, but we've tried to distill it down, you know, into fairly concise and simple, and even created some uh, practical guidance videos in terms of you know the nest boxes, how to you know build nest boxes, where to site them, how to um how to to monitor them. So all that information is contained in the guidance document. And please do, if you're considering this, the Barnall action, or if you're an advisor, please do refer back to that. Um, and and, and, and this is the type of information that's included within that document. And I think this is really, really, really important is to firstly decide whether a particular farm um, is suitable for this action or not. And if it's not, then obviously, you know, you don't have to go any further. If it is, then then you move on to the next step as to how to appropriately implement it. And just to to, to run down through these quite quickly. So it's a quite, quite a straightforward process. There's, there are a few basic criteria that you need to meet, but also there's a few criteria that you need to make sure that you're not placing um you're not uh placing nest box and particularly in the wrong places because that, that can obviously then you know have the opposite effect and actually have a negative effect and so so one of the first things to do is to assess where your farm is if it's suitable so if your farm um is um or the, the location of the nest box is less than 500 meters from a motorway or major road dual carriageway then it's not suitable because barn owls are are susceptible to being killed on 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 major roads in particular so we don't want to be in you know sighting nest boxes close to you know close to major roads then also the 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 location of the nest box of the farm should be below 300 meters in altitude because above that isn't isn't very suitable for barn owls they're very much a bird of lowland farmland and then if 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 you answer yes to those questions, you get to the next stage and you look at is 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 there suitable habitat on the farm, or if there isn't, are you including some of the measures that will create suitable habitat conditions for barn owls, such as the grass margins, the arable grass margins, the winter bird food, overwinter stubble, some of some of the measures that Catherine was um was uh, uh was focusing on. And if you can answer all of those, uh, if you can answer yes to all of those questions, then you move on and then you get into the specifics of how to, where to site the nest box, where, you know, where is suitable on the farm and, uh, and, and the type of nest box. And again, it's, it's, it is relatively straightforward. Um, 
the these are there's two types of nest boxes there's an interior nest box which you can you you can see here and quite uh, quite a straightforward design the, the design plans are all on the 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 guidance document and obviously just as it says in the just a, a, as the name implies these nest boxes are for interior spaces so barns or sheds um and and there's a few basic criteria to make sure that you're selecting the right place um, and also to make sure that the nest there's very specific the, the designs of the nest box and to make sure that they're correct because you know even with you know a little bit if you you know uh, uh, sway a little bit from the, the the proper design such as not having a ledge or if the box isn't deep enough then that 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 can create that that can create problems so it is fairly simple and straightforward as all the information is there but it's just it, it, it is necessary to um to to adhere to the to, to the guidance and to get the to get the design of the nest box and the location um correct um, if you don't have a suitable interior space for nest box, sorry, these are just examples of these are you know really suitable um buildings for uh for nest boxes, just to give you an idea. And um, you know, and what what you want is that you know a building that's mostly free from disturbance, that is going to be open permanently, so the birds obviously have access in and out, and and yeah, and, and also as well that you can uh, sight the box, you know, at um relatively high three meters and more, and also so that's you know um safe from access to uh to predators. Um, the and then this is the other nest box type, which is for exterior, which is the exterior nest box. So if you don't have a suitable building on your farm, you can still um uh, adopt this measure if you if you know if there's a suitable exterior space, so particularly on uh, on a tree that's large enough to uh, to hold the weight of the box. And uh, this, uh, the, obviously, you can, uh, as you can tell, the nest box design is a little bit different to the interior box. It's a little bit uh, more of a, 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 a complex design, um, and also as well, the materials are different. Obviously, it's a box for 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 outside, so it requires marine ply. So it's and also you know appropriate um, uh, sealant and weatherproofing to make sure it can stand up to the elements. Um, and um and then you're looking for a suitable mature tree facing out onto open open land and that again is nice and obvious from the the Barnell's perspective and uh, and these are some examples of suitable trees that we have selected for um for Barnell nest box and a lot of these that have worked uh, very very well and have, and, and have encouraged birds and birds are, are are nesting in the nest boxes um uh, it, it is possible to install exterior boxes um, uh, on uh, buildings and on structures sometimes as well. And that is, you know, if, if there isn't a suitable tree uh, present. And I would say with, with all of the nest boxes, you, you know, obviously there's health, health and safety considerations. They're much, much larger nest boxes than, you know, the the, the smaller nest boxes for, um, you know, for the likes of great tit and, and, and blue tit and the likes. So it, do, it is a, a two person job and obviously you need to be you need to be very careful um, installing them both in terms of the you know the installation and also to ensure that the the location is safe as well that you're and um, that you're installing the nest box and there's uh other considerations as well in terms of monitoring the nest box ensuring that once the nest box is in place that you're not causing any disturbance um around or in proximity of the nest box because barn owls can be very sensitive to disturbance and obviously once the nest box is up you know the ideal scenario is bird, birds move in hopefully breed there and if they do you want to ensure that they're that they're you know that they're safe there and that and that there is no disturbance to the to the birds particularly during the breeding season um that's the nest box measure if and then um, alongside that, it's it's essential to review your approach to uh, rodent control on the farm and to implement integrated pest management. And I would say that there is uh, a lot of information in terms of integrated pest management, how to go about this, how to plan your rodent control program, both in the guidance documents and also through the campaign for responsible rodenticide use, which has uh, loads of information in terms of, you know, the, the risks of inappropriate use of rodenticides um, and and, and also how to how to change and how to improve your your, your you know uh, your 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 road and control um strategy and it is a requirement true if you adopt the Barnell action to um to maintain records of use of, of red insights if you do use them that their use is justified because I think one of the one of the issues with um a exposure to red insight to wildlife in Ireland is that um that there that there's not enough thought gone into you know which situations may require use of red insights and which don't and I think you know it's it's unfortunately all too an easy you know a, a solution to put out red insights and, and even in situations where they're not needed where the use isn't justified and and even where they may not have any benefits 
relationships in terms of you know controlling rodents so 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 we, we, this is where we'll see huge huge benefits if we can improve and change our approach to to rodent control and as i say you know all the information is there to to, to allow you to do that and it is a requirement of the barnell action um, and then um, I won't uh, 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 go over uh, too much of what Catherine um, uh, uh, described in terms of, and, uh, but it is exactly, you know, it's along the same lines, the right action in the right place. And if you think about it, you know, aligning some of the, the measures, um, uh, some of the habitat uh, measures and that will benefit barn owls, aligning that with the provision of nest box and with, you know, appropriate rodent control is, is, is going to have huge benefits. And um, that is particularly for barn owls, it's the likes of, um, the uh, uh, actions such as the grass margins, um, both in grassland and arable, lone but grassland, winter bird food, that's a day winter bird food or previously known as wild bird cover. That's a fantastic uh, measure for, 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 for wildlife in general, but barn owls, it's good for small mammals that for, they, you know, it creates a food source for barn owls. Also over winter stubble and, and unharvested cereal headlands. And just to give you an idea, so again, um, Catherine is the expert in terms of hedgerow management, so I won't go over oh, um, uh, uh, straight to her territory here, but um, just to give you an idea of where there is, you know, uh, good hedgerow networks, appropriate hedgerow management you can see the benefits for barn owls i'm just going to play this very very short video um and this is of uh a, a barn owl that was fitted with a gps transmitter so we're able to monitor its movements as it you know went hunting around the countryside and it'll give you an idea of just how important hedgerows are um in the countryside um for barn owls so this is um a, a, a female barn owl this is the nest site where they were nesting this is in south tipperary and this is this bird going out on quite a routine um, hunting trip um, and you can see this following her movement and once she starts hunting you can see that the bird is just focused on the hedgerows flying up and down quite slow along the hedgerows completely ignoring you know the interior of the fields because it's the hedgerows where the prey is where the small mammals are and um, this bird as you can see I, I, I arrived at a uh, a rough, uh, rough grassland at, at, at the edge of a, a motorway obviously caught prey and then is flying Back to the nest site where the where the hungry uh, where were the hungry mouths uh, await because uh, this is the breeding season so there's there's young young birds back at the nest but that, that and, and we saw that time and time again it just gives a just gives a, a very quick idea just you know because th these are things that we don't see ourselves with barn owls obviously they're out and about at night but it really emphasizes just how important hedgerows are and also you know the other measures that you know the benefits that they can have if, if we get it right and if we're choosing the right actions in the right places the you know the 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 fruits of that can be he can, 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 can be substantial um so thank you very much apologies if i ran over time and um but happy to answer any any questions if there is time to do so and uh back to you there mark okay. thank you john uh really fascinating presentation as always and uh i really enjoy that video it really just shows how well how important the those linear features are and the the uh the hedgerows for 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 feeding purposes um and, and Catherine, the, the 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 right measure in the right place so important uh for, for us today. There's uh some questions coming through that we we had uh, uh we've put responses to there in the chat there uh people inquiring about the compostable film where that can be accessed so we've included that a link to that as a, a Chagask article with the the details of the two suppliers in Ireland uh on, on that page um and also then we have a link there to your previous uh, webinar as well john on on the barn owl so we do have lots and lots of questions but i have i have a, a question john uh just from uh, i suppose looking at the location of of barn owl boxes and uh, we know that a lot of farmyards can be quite busy um or animal houses as well how suitable are, are they for uh, locating uh, barn owl boxes are, are, are what are the success rates because uh, I know some the advice is to to try and find somewhere that isn't uh, so so busy. It, it, it's a really good question, something that really important to consider. What, what I would say is that we do have um, the barnal nest boxes in uh, in in some in some quite you know uh, fairly busy farmyards and busy and you know and, and and busy barns where there's a lot of coming and going. And I think you know it, it is the it is the situation that once birds get used to a certain level of you know of of of, of, of movement and of noise that they don't associate that with disturbance. But I would still highly recommend that 
where where possible to cite the boxes you know in a, in a building that is uh, quieter that is you know um where where there's less uh, less activity and if you don't have such a building that then probably the, the, then the better option is to look at to you know to look at a tree and look at the exterior box i think one of the things definitely to consider is um if you are you know looking at uh, or considering you know particular buildings for barn and less boxes to also look at not only the you know the you know how busy it is but also how how it, you know the activity over the course of the year say for example if you have a shed that um there's not a lot of activity in you know for much of the year but then there is during lambing season or you know or similar then they, that, that that's one of the worst things because then you can have you know a pair that isn't you know take you know take up the nest box and and they're not used to any you know coming and going in the building but then all of a sudden you know that you, during the breeding season there you know there can be all of a sudden you know lots of activity and that's really what you want to avoid if you think about it you know from the bird's perspective you know as in you you really want to you know a situation whereby that you know the, the there isn't a, a lot of disturbance that if they are and particularly during the breeding season if that they're nesting there you're not uh, creating a situation whereby you know you might have the birds flushed from the nest box or, or disturbed to the level that they that they you know leave the nest box during the breeding season so um and, and i know you know it, it is um uh you know it's not the situation that you know there's going to be suitable buildings on all farms and if that's the case then you know if it's not if you have a building and you know you're considering it but you think you know there's too much too too much activity too much disturbance then definitely it's um to to look at uh the, the exterior box and look at a suitable tree and if you don't have you know a, you know a, a suitable tree then then the action just isn't just isn't suitable for the farm and you know there's no point trying to you know trying to shove you know a a, a square peg into a circle hole you know and, and and that's really that's really it you know it's uh you know, looking at and assessing you know really critically is the farm suitable for this action and if it's not you know it's not but if it is then you know the the, the then 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 you're you're looking at 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 this at the you know the more specifics in terms of where to cite the nest box and so on. Just before we we move on to the questions, we did have somebody uh, suggesting that if you're not handy with a a, a screw gun and a, a hammer, that uh, you can contact uh, your local men's shed. Uh, a lot of the men's sheds across uh, Ireland are actually uh, producing these barn owl boxes, and so that might be uh, a nice. Uh, nice link to have uh, at a local level there so I, I think that's that's something that people should consider pat some really good questions coming in yeah, there uh, one that's just struck me as interesting uh, a question about if there's uh flood lighting and lighting put in a, in on farms from a, a safety and and a security perspective are these likely to have a, a, a an adverse impact and and is there any advice in relation to that Sorry, is that is that directed? Is that is that for me? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Sorry, Pat. Yeah. Um, well, again, what I would say is um, as long as the floodlights and that isn't directly, you know, on the the, the area where the birds are nesting on the nest box, then um, and, and again, as well, if it's not something that's introduced, if it's there already. So say if you imagine a scenario that, you know, the floodlights are there already, the nest box is there, the birds are choosing to nest there, then obviously they're, you know, they're, they're you know, they're, they're going to be uh, associated, they're going to be used to um, to that to the floodlights or to whatever other, you know, disturbance that might be. So I think that you know the key thing is to not to introduce things in proximity to the nest box in the, where they might um cause disturbance but if it's a case that they're there already and that the birds use them then, then it's not gonna it's not gonna uh, create a problem uh captain there's a, a, a i suppose a, a could be a very quick or a very long question should uh plants be pruned as at planting when aiming to create a top hedge Yes, for a top tedge and no for a tree line escape tedge. So that's the, the ch choice you need to make at this point. And and, and pruned down again. Pruned down to ground level, level an inch or so above the ground yeah. that the compostable film will hold. I wouldn't prune without putting a good mulch and the one the one we talk about is the compostable film. Others are possible sheep's wool and bark mulch, but everybody can use the compostable film. So it's... Catherine, you mentioned about the water courses there. Are there any measures or incentives to identify and protect uh, specific aquatic species and habitats within water courses? For instance, pearl mussels, uh, salmonide and lamprey spawning and yeah, nursery not, habitats? Not, not specific. I think if it's a, if, like they will benefit and not, not, not I mean, there is the her, per, the pearl mussel project focused on that, but the same measures are relevant to any water course. 
I imagine the the riparian strips will have an impact on reducing sediment loads and so on. Which, that, are, which is good for loads of species, including yeah. those key ones that you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Question there. There are a lot of buzzards nesting in my area. Is it advisable to put uh, barn owl boxes in an area where buzzards are prevalent and maybe use that opportunity for a comment on, on general health of raptors uh, and, and what's been happening over the last few years? Really good question. And I suppose to, to answer that, uh, the first part first is the answer is no. There's no issues with um, putting up barn owl nest boxes if you are noticing buzzards in your area. And um, uh, obviously buzzards and barn owls, there's, there's a lot of overlap in terms of what they feed on, um, you know, uh, uh, particularly uh, uh, rodents and small mammals. But um, there, there, there's generally no issues in terms of um, uh, buzzards being in an area um, uh, with barn owls. And they're both on they're both on quite different um uh, time scales obviously buzzards being diurnal being uh, being you know active during the day and then barn owls you know doing the uh, essentially doing the night shift and uh, and active uh, at night and in fact a, an awful lot now obviously buzzards being you know uh, very widespread throughout the country you know the, 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 there's overlap through there you know across the range for both barn owls and buzzards and and we haven't had any issues so definitely that that's not a deterrent or it shouldn't stop you um putting up a, a barn owl nest box um in terms of the general health of 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 raptors um yeah i suppose maybe focusing on on, on buzzards first um i because I, I think they do get, get get a lot of flack i would say uh buzzards firstly it's um it's it's great to see you know that it's, it is one of the and i suppose similar with barn owls now it is one of the you know the conservation success stories seeing the return of buzzards seeing their you know their their, their spread across the uh, across the country and i think you know as a top predator with our other top predators you know that gives us an indication as to you know uh you know a, a healthy countryside if we're seeing you know these species um, returning to the countryside and um, again similar we, we we discussed with the you know the benefits of having barn owls you know um in an area on the farm it's it's the same with buzzards we we often refer to buzzard diet as the three oars rats rabbits and rooks and uh, they can have you know huge benefit in terms of um i'm sure a lot, a lot of people listening uh they wouldn't be the, the fondest of those three um species that i mentioned so having having a top predator that is helping to control um those is definitely of benefit and i think then in terms of general raptor population um, and we discussed a, li a little bit about this uh, this morning. Um is it's 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 a bit of a mixed bag. Some of our you know species are doing reasonably well. It's great to see the barn owl recover um, uh, and 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 buzzards you know increasing. Um, but then you know the flip side of that is unfortunately kestrels, which um, a, a lot of people will be familiar with the or that the falcon that would hover. They're unfortunately declining. Hen harriers and other that their population is at a really really critical level and really worrying level. Um, in in the region of only about a hundred pairs left, and they have declined you know quite steadily in the last um. Uh, the, the, the last two decades so um so, so so there is some some positives but definitely a, a lot more work to be done and i think some of the measures that we did discuss through the barn owl action like particularly road and control the, you know that, that that's and, and again i can't stress how important a, you know a, a measure in action that is because it's not only going to benefit barn owls it's going to pe benefit the whole suite of raptors but also you know a huge range of um uh of uh, you know uh, uh, of other wildlife too there's a couple of questions in relation to uh, what one is how successful are our high poles and trees for for barn owls, and a second one uh, about what trees are is there a difference between the suitability of different types of trees for for barn owls? Really good question. Um, the firstly in terms of the um the pole boxes, yeah. The, now there's not that many pole boxes um in place in Ireland, but those that are t tend to be successful because you know it's um with the pole boxes we have the benefit of we can we, we can decide exactly where to put them and we can put them you know in in suitable habitat facing out into suitable habitat whereby with existing you know either buildings or trees are somewhat limited by you know with by but by their suitability um so the pole boxes can be hugely successful also as well they're very very open so they're very obvious from a barn owl's perspective and if you if you think about it you know if you place a pole nest box in suitable habitat even apart from nesting birds are are likely going to be using that even to perch on you know to, to hunt um around the uh, you know around uh, you know, if, if it's in suitable habitat so they can be you know a, a very good uh, success rate with um with uh, nest boxes on poles but obviously there's a bit more involved in terms of the actual you know installation of nest boxes on poles um and then secondly the um nest boxes oh or sorry the the type of trees the, to be honest there, there's no hard and fast rule in terms of the species of tree that um to put a nest box up on the more important is um firstly that 
the tree is large enough, you know, it's got a, you know, a, a sufficient, you know, diameter to, you know, to, uh, to, you know, to hold the weight of the nest box. And also as well that the tree is facing out onto open habitat. Um, like for example, barn owls, they're not a, they're not a bird of, of woodland, you know, so if you have a tree set in, you know, kind of covered or concealed or set in a few trees within even a small woodland, it's not going to be, you know, suitable for barn owls. So a tree that is, you know, either, a, you know, a, an isolated tree standing on its own or a large mature tree within a hedgerow facing out onto su suitable um uh, suitable habitat and that there's a good you know clear the, the nest box is obvious and there's clear flight paths in and out of the uh, of, of the nest boxes they're very concealed by the but by the foliage and i think that that, that, that that that's more important than the than the the type of tree the species of tree okay a couple of questions for for catherine uh, there's one saying you went very quickly over hedgerow restoration slide uh, I'm wondering, could you give more information? But maybe the there, if somebody Googles hedgerows and Chagas, you have a whole a, a suite of information available uh, to people. Uh, maybe you want to just say a little bit more about that. Look, I think that the, the concern is rejuvenation done wrong. So follow, the, as you said, we have videos with experts doing it right. So be careful before you choose that. But I'm all for it with the right a hedge that choosing the right hedge and doing it right okay and Catherine you mentioned sheep's wool for as possible for keeping down weeds under under new hedges uh do you have any more details on this well listen we're only trying at the farmers and the comers put me onto it and and Katrina and Oliver they are uh organized uh wool and we're going to try it more next year it obviously works it's how practical it is is the more you know if a sheep farmer is doing it on his own farm and with unfortunately the value of the wool it's a very good thing to do I'm not quite sure whether we can you know transport it and sell it and move it around as, as easy so um yeah we'll we'll have it on all our chagas farms um next this spring Pat Okay, and is there a, John? Is there a preferred time of year for the installation of of owl boxes or or other nest boxes? The, the, the autumn and into the winter is the best time, and um, the I think the 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 deadline in terms of the vernal action to install and the nest boxes is the end of July before the the, the following year, and um. Uh, I think well, you, you can put up a nest box at any time of year, but um, we would usually put them up at this time of year with the aim then of, you know, birds hopefully taking them up the following breeding season. So by next spring. Um, so, so the autumn, winter, typically the the, the best time to uh, to install nest boxes. And I suppose for an individual farmer putting up a nest box, like the chances of them actually getting a, a bird into it. Uh, is probably not that high, but the the advantage of having a lot of them there is it does provide the 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 capacity for the the uh, the owls just to, to spread across the countryside. Yeah, that's what you you summed it up. So so there's there's absolutely no guarantees of the nest box being taken up. You can obviously increase the the likelihood by you know positioning it in in, in a suitable location and you know and 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 linking with the with with, uh, with, with the habitat measures. But uh, but but there is no guarantee. But I would say that we we have started to see you know an increase in uptake um of the nest boxes that that we've put up. And um say for example just there recently we had thirty nest boxes put up in county uh, county Offaly the following year there was six breeding pairs in those thirty yeah. nest boxes which 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 isn't you know which isn't bad but um and, and i would say as well that you know it's it's generally not immediate you know you might put up a nest box might be nothing in it for next year the next year after that you know it, it can take some time but obviously you know you're not you're, you're not going to get uh, birds in the nest box if you don't uh, if you don't uh, put it up in the first place um sure. and and i would say that you know with the population hopefully continuing to increase obviously the likelihood of um of the uptake of nest box is going to increase with that as well but don't be disillusioned. Yeah, John, exactly. We, we, keep keep we, the faith. We're, <laughs> we're almost out of time. I have two two final questions for you. Uh, question there. We, we, we often have a lot of uh, non-farmers uh, tuning into us on a Friday morning. And for those people uh, who may be part of a group or a local environmental group, are there is there funding out there for, to, to support them uh, to to, uh, you know, put up boxes or do do these types of environmental activities? Um I know leader. There's a big emphasis now on biodiversity. Is that something that you'd you'd advise people on? Maybe Catherine, you could comment on it also. John, sorry, John, are you there? Sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I would say like um, there's been a huge number of um local community led um barnal nest box schemes and, and they've had you know huge huge benefits and it is as I say because it's a relatively straightforward measure to carry out so definitely I would encourage you know groups if they if they have the capacity if they have the interest in doing so that there can be huge benefits in that in terms of funding um that the, there is funding sources out there we've worked with a lot of you know uh, community groups individuals um there is funding out there potentially through leaders you mentioned through other um through other schemes such as the Heritage Council, also through the National Parks and Wildlife Service, through the Local Biodiversity Action Plan Fund, and that's administered through local authorities. So there definitely are potential funding sources out there, and um, and I would I would definitely recommend it as um you know and and we're happy to help in terms of providing any any advice or guidance. But I would yeah it, it can be a really a really uh, good measure for you know local community groups, other you know other groups, conservation groups to carry out, and and it, and you know and it has been and and that's been tried and tested now you know in, in quite. A few areas um with 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 a lot of a lot of benefits to show from those schemes for for people who want to maybe learn a bit more about birds john and and identification you know we're we're all surrounded by birds and uh to 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 actually get a better understanding is there are there local courses or um workshops that are, are held that people could there is indeed. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, definitely I would recommend um uh visiting the Birdwatch Ireland website. Also, we have local branches right throughout the um right throughout the, the country which hold events and talks, um, which hold guided guided walks, um, you know, so that you know you can learn from experts in terms of going out, you know, identifying birds by by seeing them by by, by their calls as well. We also hold workshops and, and in fact surveys that you can get involved with. One which I'd recommend is the, the garden bird survey that you can quite simply look out your window. Window and 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 learn to identify the the birds that that, that visit vis, visit your garden as well as other surveys like the countryside bird survey. Um, so there's a there's a range of of different surveys that you can get involved with, learn from, and uh, and there's a lot of resources as well on our on our website and also on our YouTube channel and, and specifically on Barnell there's there's a range of of videos if you just want to become more familiar with the with, with the bird and, and and its conservation. So I definitely recommend checking those out. That's great, John. Thank you so much. And look, the the message is there's there's lots of resources available there, particularly uh, on the Barnell, but also on that, that hedgerow side of things, the, the restoration piece. And I know, Catherine, you've done a number of webinars in that area. So uh, definitely something that people can can search on the Chagask website Mark, or YouTube Mark, channel. Go ahead. Yeah, Catherine. One comment. I, I'm not sure if we mentioned this. 11 and over 11,000 Barnell boxes gone in under acres. So that's yeah. this super for you know making a difference there thank you really significant yeah absolutely okay Catherine and john thank you so much uh for, for coming uh, and joining us this morning and pat thanks for helping with questions uh next week we're going to be joined by dr melinda lyons from the technological university of dublin and uh, melinda will be speaking about e ecologically significant habitats on farmland in in ireland so we really look forward to welcoming welcoming Melinda next week so until uh, next Friday enjoy the long uh, weekend and uh, hope you all have a happy Halloween and uh, we will talk to you again next Friday thanks a lot thanks very much bye thanks very much everybody thank you